Hello and welcome to the Austin Forum Upload, where we explore pervasive and emerging technologies and their influence and impact on society. In this series, we upload direct to you information, opinions, and insights from thought leaders, experts, and creatives from Austin and beyond. They'll share their perspectives through conversations, interviews, debates, discussion, and more. I'm Jay. I'm John. And I'm Barbary. And we co-produce the Upload for the Austin Forum on Technology and Society. Welcome to the Austin Forum Upload. I'm Jay Boisseau, the director of the Austin Forum and the host for this episode. This is an encore performance by a couple of guests that we've had on the show before. I'm very pleased to welcome back Byron Reese, the CEO of GigaOM, an author and futurist, and Professor J. Craig Wheeler, the Samuel T. and Fern Yanagisawa Regents Professor of Astronomy Emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you both for coming back to the Austin Forum Upload. Great pleasure to be here. Hello, happy to be here. We had such a wonderful time the the first episode when Barbary was also co-hosting with me that we could have talked all day and we realized at the end of it we we had 10 topics on a board and we sort of scattershot across all 10 of them and realized we should make a series out of this. So I appreciate you coming back so we can begin to drill down into one of those. And the one I'd really like to focus on today is AI and ethics and fairness. So AI itself is a complicated topic. Uh, Not everybody knows what it is, but everybody's heard about it. Um, And they're hearing about issues of fairness and bias and ethical concerns. So before we jump into that topic, Byron, why don't you give us a quick working definition of AI? Artificial intelligence doesn't have a consensus definition. That's because we aren't really even sure what intelligence is. Mm -hmm. But put simply, um, we're training machines to do things and to learn as uh, they do them, so that your usage of a system alters its future performance in what it does. So, Craig, do you have anything to add to Byron's working definition of artificial intelligence and machine learning? Yeah, so one thought in my mind is the old statement that to err is human, but to really mess up takes a computer. And and we're now using this uh, machine learning to do these vast things that have large sociological implications, and they have implications for individuals, and it's just a new framework in which I think we have to treat tread very carefully and, and ask these ethical questions. That's, that's a great point. I mean, we may not think of ethical concerns when we think about an artificial intelligence learning to play the game of Go and beating the world champion, but we're on the cusp of using AI to make all kinds of decisions from approval for a loan rate to detection of a medical condition to autonomous driving. And so that leads to considerations of ethics. Uh, Byron, what are the what are the kinds of ethical considerations that we have to take into account when we start depending on machine learning systems? I think there are three. The first one is uh, there are ethical issues around how you code a machine learning system. And, and the reason it's a challenge is because collectively as a society, we don't have a common ethic that we all share. So how are you going to code them? And then the second question is, uh, how do you use that system ethically? And then uh, the third and final one, which we're not quite to yet, is how do you treat that system ethically? Is it an entity that has some rights or or anything? So how do you code the system ethically? How do you use it ethically? And then do you have to treat the system ethically? Those are the three bits. Let's start with that middle one, actually. How do you use it? So let's operate under the assumption that People are developing machine learning based AIs of different types that we're interacting with. How do you how do you make sure these AIs are acting in ethical ways? They're they're computers, so they don't have a heart or a soul, and we can debate the existence of soul and things like that, but they're just acting based on algorithms and data. But as you pointed out, there's aspects in the coding and then in the application. So Byron, what do, we, what do we have to be careful for in the application of these in particular? Well, the kinds of things that people worry about uh, are things that make the news. Is it ethical to use them to uh, look for criminals in an airport? Is it ethical to use them to try to identify uh, behaviors in people that might indicate they're about to go commit a crime? Is it ethical to use them in warfare to kill other people? If you have an c- autonomous car, is it ethical for it to plow down somebody in order to save the driver. And those are the kinds of questions that, they're, they're very real questions we have to ask. And, uh, and 
and, and I think we have trouble answering them because, again, we don't have a consensus on ethics. And it's just so alien to us to have to articulate what our policy is on these things. Normally, we just leave this stuff up to people, and it's like, eh, you know, whatever. We have a judicial system that assigns exactly. blame as exactly. in the absence of having a de- definitive rule. For Somebody's it. got to decide on these yeah. things. So here's a, an interesting take on this. Speaking of the judicial system, uh, the judicial system implies that we have free will so that we can make decisions. We can decide to be a criminal or we can decide to be a, a good person. But you do these physiological studies... And it, and it comes out over and over again that, that the brain will decide to do something, like reaching for this cup, and, and that will fire and neurons will start doing things, and then the consciousness wakes up at some measurable delayed time later. And so the whole question of whether we really have free will or, or not is, is confusing, and then you bring it into the judicial system that is based on that, and that's where all our ethics and rules come from. And, and now you bring this in with this AI making these decisions that we don't quite know how they arrive at them and we don't quite know what the database is and, and, and unleash that on our society. I, I think we, we, we just have, you know, we have to have conversations like this one to ask these questions and how do we get involved in it? And we have to have people from very diverse points of view and diverse perspectives to be involved in the discussion of, of how we treat these things going forward. We, we can't just let a bunch of companies with their AI developers or a bunch of academics with their AI developers just unleash on the world. It's got to be more controlled than that somehow. You you bring up a great plug for the Austin Forum and activities like it. So I, I appreciate that. It's one of the things that I posit is that things are changing faster every day, whereas human lifetimes experience the same 24 hours every day. And so Indeed. it becomes important Indeed. to have these kinds of conversations and raise awareness faster so that we can establish appropriate laws and cultural norms and social etiquette and whatnot. But but things are moving fast, and that's, that's not going to change. Technology is advancing exponentially. Byron, you have a great thing in your book about this and the, the power of exponentials and exponential advances in, under, in knowledge. But that doesn't really apply to cultural norms and social etiquette, does it? No, and I, and I tend to worry about this issue a little less than other people. And, and let me say why, which is, we're brand new at this, and so it's that's not, what worries me, Brian. <laughs> it's not going to be perfect out of the gate. You know, when people say a self-driving car killed somebody, I mean, it's front-page news. And but but the thousands of people that die through human-driven cars isn't. And and I think directionally, what people should ask, and I think I'm not rigging the question. It really is the question, and, and you can argue both sides. Is in the end, do you want data? And uh, do you want data about the past to inform uh, systems that themselves are not biased? Data can be biased, but the systems generally aren't to make decisions. Or do you want to leave it to people? And and what happens is anytime you you say, well, this computer did this thing wrong, um, nobody generally compares that to, well, this human did these 800 things wrong. And, and so it's easy just to look at it. It's like that self-driving car having a fatality. It's like, in the end, are these systems going to be better than people at making decisions? So are you comfortable with having an AI replace a 12-person jury? That is uh, a fantastic question. And that really is... Um, th- so there's been a lot of talk about using them for sentencing to make sure that once a person's been found guilty that you apply sentencing um, in a consistent way. We're nowhere near, you know, I've never seen an AI system that could answer the question, what's bigger, a nickel or the sun? We're nowhere near a computer being able to take in all kinds of evidence about a crime and weigh it and all of that. But But but, it's coming at us exponentially. Well, So today, no. I, 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 I personally am in the camp that doesn't believe machines can ever do that. Well, I don't know how that one is not biased by human decisions anyway because all the ground truth data that you would train the decision on is previous decisions of what juries decided. So so you're inherently using human decision data to train the AI. So you are comfortable having an AI replace a 12-person jury? Uh, I don't know if I said that, (laughs) but but I I think that's that's a very difficult one because all your training data is based on humans, whereas I can see the definition for autonomous driving, for example, 
I can see the definition of rules as a possibility. What is a road? What is an intersection? What is a traffic signal? What is this, a rule, et cetera? And so there's more rules in that that can guide the decisions. Although, as Byron already alluded to, if something unforeseen happens, a meteor lands in the road in front of the car and the car can't brake in time, is the car going to swerve and hit the five children on the sidewalk or swerve the other way into the side of a building and kill the driver? And let's be clear that it isn't really the technology that people have application uh, have problems with. Um, facial recognition is a hot button issue, but a facial recognition that, for instance, well, we all use, or many of us use it on our telephone, right? It recognizes our face and lets us in. Would I want a door uh, lock on my back door so I don't have to fish for my key that it just recognizes my own face and unlocks the door for me? Absolutely. What 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 people have trouble with and what they do disagree on is, well, do you want uh, that same system to, to look for, for criminals or do you want it to, to do all of these other things? So it really is matters of policy that, that we have so much difference on. And it isn't, it isn't strange that we have these differences of opinion because, again, these technologies are, are so new that uh, we, we shouldn't expect that these are easy questions. And I'm realizing I'm being a little self-inconsistent because I absolutely believe in data-based decisions in general, mm -hmm. rather than making stuff up. Uh, it's just what happens if it goes to this big degree is, is, is well, what concerns me, I guess. Let me establish some boundary conditions then for this. These are open-ended questions, and I'm mm -hmm. glad we're having these conversations. But Byron, I'd like you to tell me about a decision that you'd be comfortable with an AI making that it's not currently making today. And maybe one that you would you can't envision yourself, if there is one, feeling comfortable with an AI making instead of humans. I think the core question is going to be, are, are people machines? And I don't think people are. And therefore, um, but computers clearly are. And so I think there's an enormous amount of decisions that people have to make because they have to do with uh, love and values and all of these things that are so alien to a computer. And so the vast majority of decisions in my life, I do not want a computer to make. That being said, there's a whole lot that I do that oh, how, how I get from point A to point B uh, in, the, in the car and all of these things, I'm, I'm very comfortable with. And I now believe the system when it tells me to turn left, even though I think, I think I should turn right. It's like, I believe it at this point. And I so, will say that I still don't. I'm still frustrated with the direction capabilities I get. From you're Google probably Maps. better at navigating <laughs> than me. I'm a menace at best. Um, and so I think the, the the vast majority of decisions are for people. To, by the way, J. Cra and, um, Weizenbaum uh, was a man in the '60s who um, made a system called Eliza. That was uh, an AI that you could, was very rudimentary, but you could say, I feel bad today. And it would say, why do you feel bad? And I feel bad because of my mother. Why, what did your mother do? Very simple. And Weizenbaum, when he saw people pouring out their heart to it, he turned against AI and computers and, and said that it's a human prerogative to, you know, com computers should only give you information. It's a computer's, it's a, it's a value judgment on what to do with that information. And so I don't trust computers to do anything related to values, but I trust them to do almost everything related to data. And I don't worry that, um, yes, the data is not perfect. And yes, uh, people, you know, with mustaches are going to be thought to be bombers more often than people without mustaches. And it's like, that's the kind of stuff we're going to work out. And by the way, people carry a lot of baggage of, you know, uh, they, you know, dated somebody named Fred who turned out to be a bad guy. So this guy is probably, a Fred is probably a bad I mean, people are like that. I'm and glad none of us are named Fred. But yeah, but two of us in this room have mustaches, though. I, just <laughs> I didn't notice that. Uh, so just to be me, clear, that's Craig and the producer, not me or Byron. Right. <laughs> he didn't have to say that. Um, coming back to the question of the uh, sentencing, which AI is getting involved in now. Isn't that a value thing? I personally do think it is, unless you say... Well, so, so do I. This is why Humans I'm... are so broken at it that 
uh, we need machines to, to do it. I don't personally believe that. I think the studies that say people go to prison longer right before lunch than after lunch, and I think a lot of that's largely been debunked. But you could make the argument that people are so bad at it, so inconsistent, that uh, we need machines, objective machines, for guidance. We, we tried to instantiate that same guidance into law and to have mandatory sentences, and we haven't necessarily all been happy with that outcome. And that's what data does. That's what the AI would do, is it would instantiate it in, with data. The, the one problem with AI systems like this is that they appear to have more virtue than people. Because it could say, mustached people, you know, are more inclined to do whatever. <laughs> Retired professors are more inclined to do whatever. But... Um, Narrow it down now. <laughs> people named Craig are more just... But... When the computer says it, people say, well, it's objective. That must be the truth. And to the extent people that it, that it, that it puts a halo on the decision to say, oh, well, a computer made it. A computer is not biased. Um, it's true that a computer isn't biased, but the data may very well be. And so I think we, we just need to say, are the machines in the end going to be better at teasing patterns out of data than people? And I, I tend to say yes. So I don't worry about these technologies. But there certainly are cases where the, the computers with the current uh, procedures, neural networks and deep learning and all that, can tease patterns out that people don't see. It's, it's very dramatic and very exciting. And, um, so that's, that's a good thing in principle. But it, it's, it is, it, they're just these issues that, that are, are changing so fast and they're and they're so fluid and delicate that we just need to be very careful about it. I mean, what, what I mean by it, how do we be careful? I'm not quite sure. This is what this conversation is furthering. I hope. I think you guys have hit some great points that I totally agree with. I I, I trust people on value decisions. I trust computers on data driven decisions. Mm -hmm. The problem is there's an increasing number of decisions that are facing us in which we're using computers to inform the people that are making the value assessments, and in some cases, yes, we'll relieve them of it. I mean, an autonomous driving system, in the advent of some disaster, something happens, the system is going to have to make a nanosecond decision that is effectively a value decision. And so this probably gets in some ways to your your first ethical consideration. How is the, how is the AI system coded? Not just what the data, not just how is it applied, but how is it even coded? Because somewhere in there, they're going to need to be in that AI system, there are going to need to be some value judgments that we haven't solved as a species. And what we've done collectively is defaulted to say we're going to use the values of 20-something males living in the Bay Area. <laughs> That's what it is. I'm, I'm laughing, but yes. 20-something males that live in the Bay Area because they're the one, or that live in Beijing. Well, because, suddenly I'm against AI, but okay. <laughs> well, no, no, that's just it. That's what we've done by making no decision. It's whoever's, you know, there at there you go. No, that's, 11 o'clock at night. That's putting my concern kind of concretely is that these things have just evolved so quickly and into those little you know, basins of attraction that, that maybe we don't want to be there. And, and so how do we back out of that? And the trick is uh, humans, ethical systems can't, I don't think, be coded. And the reason is, is and I put this in, in my book, is if I say, is stealing wrong? You say yes. And then you say, well, is stealing uh, because you're starving wrong? And it's like, well, no. Or it is stealing from uh, Nazis in World War II wrong? No. Well, it's stealing from a children's hospital in Nazi Germany that doesn't have enough bread, taking their bread. Is that wrong? Well, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> and you can just go for as long as you want. And, and every, every, every ethical construct has all these provisos that we have a lifetime of experience dealing with. But try to code that. Try to code is stealing wrong. And you, you're not going to be able to, even if we all agreed, you couldn't code it. And, and we don't all agree. And in fact, you could argue no two people agree. Well, so we're not, but we're not really coding these things, right? We're, we're setting up a, a learning system. I and mean, it's not a, a rules-based system as we, I mean, neural networks and all that is, is very different. So you have something like a, what is it, a, a, a adversarial networks. Mm -hmm. GANs. Yeah, GANs. So you get one neural network fighting against another and checking them and whatnot, and they develop this, this understanding of something about the data. 
and and we haven't instructed that at all. It, it's all self generated there. So how do you? But you know, we're not putting ethics in or not putting ethics in. It's, it's, it's just it's off in some other part of parameter space. True, because uh, when we were chatting before the show and we're about self driving cars, Mercedes, I believe, has actually come out and said we protect the driver. You know, that's an ethical decision we have made. If you build a, a, a weapon system that's a drone that goes in and tries to look for soldiers and only blow them up, you're going to have to put in some amount of, well, I think it's a soldier, but it may not be. And you're going to have to draw some line to where you say, I'm confident enough it's a soldier. I mean, in the end, people are going to have to come up with the the, the guiding precept to it, and that's an ethical judgment. Well, in our current situation, the adversary often isn't a soldier in a uniform at all. And, you know, some guy with a balaclava on it. So how do you know he's a skier versus a terrorist? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. know. It's a lot of very subtle questions. Yeah, I think one of the really important points is these machine learning algorithms, as you said, they, they learn from data. And so they can't be any better than the quality of, of the data that we give them. But they're also not... You know, uh, their correlation more than cause, right? And so it is, that's a good point. Yeah, it's they, correlation. Yeah. They don't derive their answers from first principles. They derive them from data, and so they're not very applicable to scenarios for which we might have a real clear value judgment, but we haven't trained it on data that affects that outcome with that clear value judgment yet. Well, leaping so ahead to the issue of whether. Computers can be conscious. So Byron thinks maybe not. I have a suspicion maybe so. But if if they are, we use some. You use the word alien earlier. I think they're going to be very alien. They are not going to have evolved out of a human system, evolving out of Africa and our social interactions. It could be a very very different kind of thing. And so how you how you work ethics into something which is just completely alien to the human condition. Um, even if they're conscious, I, I, that's a long way down the pike, but I can see the issue coming. And again, I'm, I, as much as I defend these systems, you have to be mindful of data selection. I'm the first to agree with that. And you can illustrate this principle pretty easily. You can go to Google and type um, unprofessional haircuts, and you're going to get a certain uh, minority bias in that because enough people have mentioned on the web, I can't believe they showed up with this unprofessional haircut. You uh, suspicious looking people, just type that in and go to images, you're going to get. And so that's an example of data which has had value judgments imputed to it that uh, it, that's the fear that you train these systems on that data. It's It should give people a lot of comfort that the vast majority of data isn't like that when, when you try to correlate um, heart, you know, heart flutters mm-hmm. to uh, future heart attacks and right. you try to correlate consumption of certain foods to certain outcomes. I mean, most of the time we aren't packing all of that stuff, but, but there are exceptions. And, and so we do have to be very mindful of like, how did you select the data? And, uh, and that's never going to be solved, by the way, by government. I, I don't believe. Not just how you select the data, but how is the data labeled for the training to begin with? Enough, if, yes. the, if the data is objectively labeled, uh-huh. you have a better chance of developing a good machine learning model from it that will reproduce objective uh, predictions and classifications. If it's subjective data, like the two examples you just mentioned from the Google searches, it's going to replicate subjective assessments mm-hmm. based on data that's been subjectively labeled. So let's hit Byron's point of just saying that you don't think the government should be involved in this, uh, whatever this is that is setting these standards or, or whatnot. How, how do we set these standards? I'm, I'm not saying it should be the government. I, I only I mean, your reservation, but how do we, right. how do we take these young guys in the millennials and Silicon Valley and and get them to think in this broader, my work has implications. That I might Tune in next week for the answer <laughs> to that question. Um, I, the only reason I don't think government can do it, I mean, you know, we, we, have a, we have a system of government that, you know, most of don't own computers or send email. I mean, they're so unequipped for these kinds of issues. And the issues change, as you point out, so rapidly. There's no way legislation, I think, can lead it. Um, I believe, I suspect will come up with uh, a consensus as a society. And the only reason we don't have one is because it's all just very, very new to us. We've never had to ask these questions before. We've never had to articulate it before. And we don't even necessarily have language that is equipped. You know, should the computer choose that? It's like, does the computer choose anything? The computer saw 
that and thought it was a security breach. Well, the computer didn't see anything. It didn't think any. But our language is so ill-equipped for these sorts of questions that it's just going to take us a while to get there. And again, I, I just hope people have enough presence of mind to say, well, in the end, there are things I want data to inform because I, 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 I trust the, the hive more than any bee in it. You brought up a really good point that I hope our listeners uh, understand about machine learning, which is the computer doesn't see X or Y. The computer is fed data, and it's often fed labels, and it determines features that are consistent with everything that was labeled accordingly. So the computer doesn't understand if you try to train it to recognize cats in an image. It actually doesn't understand cats. But if you give it 10,000 images that are labeled cat and 10,000 that aren't, it eventually finds all the things that it thinks were common at various scales mm -hmm. to the images that had a label of cat applied to it. And by the way, of course, we're all training these algorithms and we go to those websites and it says click on all the squares that have a traffic light in it or a, or a car in it. And so we're labeling data for it. And with enough labels, correct labels, it comes up with its patterns in there, but it's, there's not real understanding there. It's like you said at the very yeah. beginning. It's really about finding patterns. And if we don't give it a cause and effect relationship, we merely give it data that comes from us very powerful for many uses, but it doesn't really extrapolate very well. And it doesn't have true understanding like a human might that that cat is a mammal and a pet and so on. Right. I mean, eth ethics is all about cause and effect, though, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. Right. Yeah, I think your Zen Cohen to think about is no computer knows how to play chess. They don't play that's chess. A, that's a great point. Yeah. They can win, right. but they don't really understand chess. They understand they patterns that lead to an outcome. They sure look like it. It's also the difference between an, a, a, a simulation of something and an instantiation of something. I actually think that's the core. Uh, a computer can simulate a hurricane, right? And it can, um, but it's not an instantiation of a hurricane. There's no hurricane inside the computer, but it can simulate it. Uh, and, and, and I think computer intelligence is, in the end, simulated intelligence. I don't think it's actually intelligence. It's not an instantiation of intelligence. It's not a, really an intelligent thing. It can merely imitate it. So you would say it's just more like super advanced evolved statistics than a real yeah. reasoning capability. You know, you, you, your dog does something and you go, he thinks he's people. And it's like your computer does it. And it's like, oh, it thinks it's people. It's playing chess. And it's like, no, it doesn't think it's people. It yeah. doesn't. Well, that's, therein lies the question. Do we is. just think we're people? <laughs> well, and there's people who think that we're just a simulation being played out. And yeah, it's the whole universe. And in some level, that is true. We are particles and forces of nature that are uh, interacting with particles and energy. And we're actually a, a living implementation of a simulation in that regard. I don't believe that. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I, I don't. I think that's... Um, but that's another episode. That is another the episode. simulation theory. Well, so let's close this episode with what is your current hot button issue about AI and ethics? What are you most concerned about in the near term? What policy or law or ordinance or social norm or uh, aspect of social etiquette do you... Are you most concerned about with the application of AI? So this this may be a little bit off your question, but I came into this with this particular hot button item. So if I could speak to it just briefly, this this proposal of Elon Musk to do this neural link and put electrodes in there and communicate between you and the cloud at very high bit rates, and that just scares the bejesus out of me because. It, it's the next step towards a hive mind, and I don't think I want to go there. And 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 so is that an ethical question, an AI question? I'm not sure, but it, it would just completely change everything about humanity and how we interact and everything. I I think we we need to think really carefully before we go into something like that. I mean, I for, think, what we're going to find out is we're all uh, thinking about sex all the time. I mean, uh, that already. <laughs> so what what's the point? And for the record, I don't believe that's possible. Um, I, I brains are notoriously squishy things. We don't know how a thought is encoded in the brain. We don't. We don't. We, we I mean, we know so little about how the brain works. We don't even know how the nematode brain works. with only 300 neurons, and we've been studying that for 20 years. It's like I think it's all. That's a bunch of hype. That's just me. Um, 
to answer your question, what do I worry about? I will tell you what I worry about. I do think these technologies can be used uh, to destroy privacy. And the reason is, is we all have privacy uh, because there's so many of us. You can't follow everybody at once. You can't listen to every phone call at once. But uh, with AI, you can. You can listen to every phone call. You can study everyone. The, the, you can, uh, com cameras can read lips now as well as people. You can read, uh, AI can read, quote unquote, every email. And the very tools we build that look for cures for cancer can also look for people who um, might not be for the present government. And you can act accordingly. So the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And, and I do think that we have, and, and in, in, in many countries of the world, that can all be addressed. We just resolve, we're not going to let that happen. But the people that are developing these systems that can do that technology are already exporting it to regimes that uh, have no problems suppressing the rights of minorities in favor of, of their self-rule. So I, I think that's the, the real worry. So I think we were saying the same thing. I was leaping further down the line in terms of this high mind stuff, but it's that privacy and giving that up, and uh, that, that really is the concern. And that's Eternal certainly regions. one of the big issues of our time, right, is that we all benefit from these free services. We all use these products and services that are collecting data. Data analytics is a powerful tool for improving the products and services that companies give us. But it's also a powerful tool for other things, and the data can be accessed by others in some cases or stolen and shared and used for all kinds of purposes. So um, we have an Austin Forum event coming up on September 17th, 2019. If you listen to this before that date, Byron Reese will be one of our debaters on that topic of data, privacy, and ethics. So we thank you for tuning in today, though, and we look forward to a future episode with Byron and Craig. We'll come back and talk about AI, robotics, and the future of humans in the workplace. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Austin Forum Upload. You can listen to additional episodes and check out a schedule of our monthly in-person events at austinforum.org. The Upload is a production of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, a nonprofit organization here in Austin, Texas.